Open up your Bibles, first chapter of the book of Joshua. So we began with an introduction to this incredible book last week. We now find ourselves, along with Joshua, with the initial word to Joshua that is for us really some lessons in leadership. We often use this first chapter at pastor's conferences for that purpose, but before you think, well, this is not for me, remember that every single believer in some capacity is a leader. You're a leader in your own home. You're a leader in the workplace. You're a leader in your community. You're likely a leader in the church in some capacity. Every single believer, ultimately, because we are disciples, which means we're followers, ultimately somebody's going to be following you, which makes you a leader. And so very important lessons that we have here in this first chapter, lessons in leadership, and tonight part one, remember that next week, We'll be meeting on Wednesday as we have our Thanksgiving service, and we'll be also celebrating communion, so don't show up on Thursday next week, because we'll all be in comas after having had Thanksgiving dinner and tripping on tryptophan. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, and thank you for your word, which is always true. And so, Lord, we give you tonight, and we pray that you would take uh, these verses, and Lord, speak to us as your children. Instruct us from heaven, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 again, and then after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, my servant Moses is dead. And now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Now when you think about this, as I mentioned last week, Moses is stepping into uncharted territory, uncharted waters. He's filling Moses' shoes. Joshua is about to do something that I think most of us have some aversion to, have some fear of. And in fact, very often, if you happen to be someone who's filling in for someone else, maybe it's in the workplace. Maybe it's the first time you ever got promoted to that position of leadership in the workplace. Or maybe uh, you're that person that now is going to lead that cohort in a college group. Or maybe you are the person that now is going to be responsible in that area of ministry, you're actually going to lead maybe a missions team. You step into that leadership role. Very often, our first thought is, am I going to do as well as the person before me? Am I going to be able to succeed in light of that? Because all of us, I think, have a built-in fear uh, that we are not going to succeed. The other thing that we fear is what other people will think of our leadership. It's a natural occurrence in the mind of most human beings. The problem is, with regard to God's role in all of this, if we really see it from his perspective, then if he has called you, then he has to equip you, and it really lies on him to get the job done. It's actually not on you. And the problem generally comes when we take too much of this on ourselves. And we begin to think that we're actually the solution to the problem. Or or that we need to be better than the person that was there before us. And by better, I simply mean we compare ourselves to other people. And the fact of the matter is, is that none of us are exactly the same. Amen? And in fact, some of us have gift sets that are very complimentary. Others have gift sets uh, that are extremely extraordinary and they're nothing like something that you may be accomplished at or able to uh, do. And it may be that it is the combination of those two sets of gifts that actually make the solution to the problem. God has all of that in view. We have a tendency to look at leadership as though there is some school you can go to 
And when you come out on the other side of it, you're going to be a leader for the Lord. And that simply isn't true. I've seen people with a lot of degrees that are absolutely atrocious leaders. And I've seen people that have very little formal training who are absolutely excellent leaders and everything in between. And so what about Joshua? Well, I can guarantee you there are some things he was thinking. Remember, he and Caleb are the only two that we're told of in Scripture that are actually going to go from the wilderness into the promised land with the new generation. Everyone else has died. So in essence, there's a new sheriff in town. There's new leadership. There's a new goal. There's new paradigm. There are so many things going on in this particular wonderful book that you could look at and you can apply them to our lives today. Uh, we've just gone through and are still going through nearly two years of a pandemic. Amen? Has anybody figured out the world is not the same place as it was two years ago? It's mind-boggling how disconnected people are. It is mind-boggling to me how many people are actually fairly comfortable in this new state of disconnectedness. In fact, we now have a new problem, and that is people think that you can simply substitute technology for relationship. And so we're seeing some very serious, I think, social problems with that regard. We have people that now think that because they have a, you know, some type of a profile on Instagram, that's really them. There's actually a false reality that some people have, and they're actually getting comfortable in it. And so if you are thinking about leading in this day and time, let me tell you a few things about leading in this day and time that are some of the same things that Joshua faced. And that is every single generation has its own difficulties. Every single people group has its own set of individual things that makes them unique. That every time you step up to lead, you're also stepping up to get shot, get beat up, get knocked down. The question is, will you get back up? Leading is not easy. It's not easy in our homes. It's not easy in the church. It isn't easy in the state or in the country. Certainly not easy in the world, ask Jesus. Jesus came to his own and they received him not. Isn't that part of the story? Even Jesus, the son of God, was rejected as a leader. Jacob is going to face some difficulties. And I think sometimes we, we rightly think, you know, God, couldn't you just get some rocks or some trees or something to do this? Because this appears to be too difficult for me. I don't know, God, that you've given me those, those gifts yet. Now think about Joshua's situation. Remember, as I said in our introduction, they're entering a land that's actually filled with people. This isn't an empty land. They're, they're not going, you know, if you move into a new house, you know, if you have the pleasure of buying someone else's former residence, very often you make an offer and they're still living in it, right? And then you go to move-in day and they're still living in it, right? And you're, you're like, oh man, we, we need to move in and you're not gone. Well, now imagine that God has told you to take over an entire region of the world and the people are still living there and they don't want to move out. They have no intention of going anywhere. In fact, they have created walled cities. Those walled cities are heavily defended they have standing armies. Those armies are actually well-equipped and well-armed. And you brought a bunch of farmers from the wilderness to fight them, right? You know, you, you show up and you got your pitchforks like, okay, we're taking you down. They had to have seemed completely ill-qualified and ill-equipped. Ill -equipped. And so you have to know that in his humanness, Joshua understood that. He's probably looking at the city of Jericho, their first target, and going, man, I am out of my mind. What are we doing? And then wait until he gets the instructions on how he's going to take it. I have to remind myself that those whom God calls 
God is responsible to equip. That ultimately, unless the Lord build the house, they that labor to build it labor in vain. That if we're not walking in the spirit, then we might well be in the flesh. If we're in the flesh, the arm of flesh will never sustain you. And so that story is the story in this book. God had judged Joshua worthy, and that is sufficient. Sometimes people don't see the same things that God sees. Sometimes the gifts that lie latent underneath the surface of someone's character are invisible to humankind, but God sees them. And the story of humanity is filled with people that you wouldn't think, well, that person's going to be a leader. I remember, because I was very much alive, when then Governor Ronald Reagan ended up being the President of the United States. Some of you are old enough to remember some of the things that were being said. Oh, this will be great. Bedtime for Bonzo meets the White House. You know, we, we have... We have now a president that his greatest claim to fame was that he was an actor. And yet, some would say he's one of our better presidents, responsible for some wonderful things, one of which I think we can all agree was absolutely wonderful. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Remember that statement? That was from an actor. But he meant it, and he was actually a gifted leader. When God is in it, that is sufficient. John Knox, writing in the 1500, said a single man with God leading him is always a triumphant majority. That's true. When God is in the forefront, when God is in the lead, then you are on a path to victory. But no matter how big your army is, the converse is also true. No matter how big and well-equipped your army is, no matter how great the group of people around you are, if God is not in it, you are on the losing team. So we have to be careful because this story is about God more than it's about Joshua. And while Joshua is the key component, humanly speaking, behind every decision, behind every battle, behind everything that is done and said is a sovereign God who rules from heaven if we will only let him. Our problem very often is we kind of want to do our own thing. And that comes back to bite Joshua upon occasion. We're going to face the same types of challenges. We're going to face the same types of difficulty But if we stay true to our calling, then if we are not ourselves gifted and able, then God will bring alongside of us someone who is. Again, this is the issue. When God calls, God equips. This is the truth that's taught in the book of Ephesians very clearly. If God has actually made the calling upon someone's life, then it is incumbent upon God to provide all of the necessary component parts to get the job done. And that may not actually be that leader. It may be someone else who comes alongside to assist. And this is certainly true in ministry. It's why I have such an aversion to this pastor worship thing or this this pastors that are, you know, somehow celebrity thing. There isn't a pastor that I know that if they would sit down and talk to you face to face and heart to heart, wouldn't admit readily that no pastor of any sizable work does everything in the church himself. There is a whole host of people that God has also called, and without that whole host of other servants who also are gifted in their calling and responding to that calling, the ministry would not move forward. That is true in this church. Over and over and over and over, I am blessed to serve with dozens and dozens of faithful people who love the Lord. Amen. Amen. Add to that our incredible slew of volunteers. There are hundreds of them. You know, right now, there's children's ministry going on, and youth ministry going on, there's high school and junior high, 
There are people in control booths and tech rooms and behind the scenes making sure the audio and the video is running the way it's supposed to and camera people and all these things. They don't just happen. God calls, God equips, and we do this thing together. Amen? It's one of the most beautiful messages of this particular book as we start. As God calls and commissions us, as God judges worthy, remember, notice what it says in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses' assistant. Now here's where it gets interesting. It wasn't that Joshua didn't have some experience. He was Moses' assistant. And very often you learn how to lead by watching someone else lead. It's a beautiful thing. It doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or a nurse, whether you're a scientist, whether you're some form of educator. It doesn't matter what skill you have. You, you work in some engineering field. You, you are in construction. You have some form of job that you do. The very best way for you to learn how to do anything is to follow someone else who's good. You want the very best people to work with before you take on any task. God saw to that in Joshua's life. Joshua worked alongside of Moses. And as we know from the book of Exodus, Moses had a few hardships, amen? The children of Israel were not easy to lead. You know, one of the striking things about the Jewish people is they're God's chosen people, they're the apple of his eye, and about them he said, my people are stubborn and stiff-necked. <laughs> it's like, okay, how did those things fit together? Well, it's true about you too. It's true, isn't it? Think about your own life. Have you always done everything God's told you to do the way God told you to do it? The answer is going to be no. Isn't for me. I haven't really met or talked to anyone who would say yes to that proposition that, well, yes, I've always done everything God asked me to do perfectly. No, we haven't. And sometimes we're stubborn and stiff-necked. That's who Joshua is now tasked with leading, a group of stubborn and stiff-necked people whose stubbornness and stiff-necked Demeanor is what caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And they had children, and those children watched their parents be stubborn and stiff-necked and wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And so you can kind of imagine that this is nothing new. When Solomon said that, there is nothing new. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. There is nothing new under the sun. As he writes in the book of Ecclesiastes, that's a truth. Humankind is still the same. We may do it differently, but the internal things that drive us are pretty much the same. Leaders always face the same types of problems. Stubborn people is certainly amongst them. And I'm going to say a few things tonight. They may be somewhat controversial, and I don't intend them to be controversial, but I want to use them as a way of an example and they are not meant to demean anyone's ministry, and it's not meant to speak evil of anyone. But the fact of the matter is, we don't, and we shouldn't, ever lead forever. That we are not any of us called. We all have, in that sense, a barcode on of us. You know, most of us look, you go into the refrigerator, if you have a... Uh, a serious concern about the milk that you have on the top shelf in your fridge, you look at the use or sell by date on it, right? And it says best if consumed by and gives you a date. All of us as human beings have a date that we are best if used by, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be spoiled milk, amen? Even great leaders get to the end of the journey, Moses did, Jacob did, Joshua is going to, while he actually is one of the longer reigning leaders in Israel's history, David certainly had his good years and then he had his bad years. He actually didn't finish all that well. 
There are great leaders that have existed, and whether that's a man like D.L. Moody or Billy Graham, or you could say Pastor Chuck or Pastor Steve or any other person, none of us are going to live forever and none of us are going to lead forever. And that's why it is incumbent upon us to look to invest in the next generation. If we don't, we do so at the peril of our own children and our children's children. If we are not forward-looking, if we do not also look behind, then we will miss the beauty of what God wants to do going forward in the future. Those of us that have been around a while, you know, think back of when you were a kid. I look back, there was no color television when I was a child. It was all still black and white. Nobody in my neighborhood had a color TV. No color TV. We had three channels. Then we got a fourth one, Channel 39 out of San Diego. It's like, woo! You go to watch a program, what did you do? You went to the television and you adjusted the rabbit ears. (laughs) Then if you were really rich, you had an antenna on the roof. Remember those days? Some of you folks are a little older, shake your heads going, yep, remember that. Then remember when they came up with the motorized antenna on your roof and you could sit in your living room and and you could hear it on the roof doing exactly that. And the thing would turn and all of a sudden the snow would kind of sort of go away and you could actually see the people on the screen. Now you can watch FUBU on your phone while you're driving going down the road. In 4K. You got to stop. You can watch two games that are going on simultaneously on your phone. You can have a smart TV to where you can have the divided screen. You can have that game going on over there and this game going on over here and Wizard of Oz on that side. We used to have to wait once a year to watch Wizard of Oz. Amen? Now imagine that you're a pastor and you start pastoring in the 1960s and you make it to 2021 and you've been in the pulpit for 60 years, you think you might kind of be in the dark ages a little bit on a few things? Maybe not quite up to speed on a couple of things? You know, your kids learned in diapers how to operate a laptop. You still don't know why it's called a laptop. (laughs) What is it on your lap and is it on top of you when you use it? You know, I've actually had, well, why is it called a laptop? Josh was facing that. This is a completely new generation that had absolutely a new worldview and they were about to enter a place where they had never been before and to bring Moses' style of leadership with them into the promised land would be fatal. It would have caused defeat. Moses was great in Moses' time, but the new time needed Joshua. Bluntly, God buries his workmen, but the work goes on. It's always been like that. It's never going to be any different. And I can tell you that over the last 35 years, I've seen a lot of ministry ideas come and go. I've seen consistent things that God always wants to do, like teach the word systematically. But you know what? Pastor Chuck was actually against PowerPoint. Pastor Chuck hated any type of visual aid. Pastor Chuck hated colored lights. And again, some of you are going, amen. But the bottom line is, we don't live in the age of yellow pads. And remember these? Overhead projector transparencies. <laughs> remember those things? And remember, oh, I flipped it over the wrong way. It's backwards. <laughs> things change. We have to change with them. 
or we become relics. The church should never become an archaeological relic. It should always be relevant. Doesn't mean that the history isn't wonderful. But the church that sits around singing kumbaya or the way we were is a church that's not long for this world. It's that simple. It doesn't mean that we have to change everything and it certainly doesn't mean that we have to change everything at once. J. Oswald Sanders wrote, a work that originates with God and is conducted on spiritual principles will surmount the shock of a change in leadership and indeed will probably thrive better as a result. That's in his book, Spiritual Leadership. From another perspective, describing the death of King Arthur, Lord Tennyson put some wise and profound words into the mouth of the king when he said, for now I see the true that the old times are dead. The old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. You see, wise leaders know when it's time to get out of the way, when to step aside. Joshua worshiped the same God as Moses. He debated the same word as Moses. But he was going to be a different leader than Moses. And they were going to be a different people than the people that Moses led. There are three principles that we see of transition that are actually in this particular part of this amazing book. And the reason I share that with you is very simple what you see here is universally true. There was continuity. The first of those principles, and we'll see it in this book, there was continuity from one leader to the next. It wasn't wholesale change. It was not that any of the absolute principles that needed to be adhered to were ever fudged on. The sanctity of God's word the attention to the holiness of God, the understanding God's sovereign purposes, that God was in fact the actual leader. None of those things were ever compromised by any great leader that you find in scripture. There was continuity in the things that mattered. And by the things that mattered, the word matters. Amen? There was continuity. That's the first principle. You're going to see this throughout the book. There's not one thing that Joshua does that when there is a command, thus says the Lord, that Joshua has another opinion. So when God speaks, God's people, if they're great leaders, will be led in doing it. The second thing, though, equally important, and to some degree the opposite, is there was not always complete conformity. And we're going to see that in the very opening chapters of this book because you're going to see the battle of Jericho and then the battle of Ai. And while one took a certain battle plan, the other did not yield to that same battle plan. There's not always conformity. There's no status that can actually be quo that is going to last, that it's a human thing related to society or to the way that we live. And so we have to be very careful. We don't have to look to conformity. In other words, things always being exactly the same. That is actually called in most contexts stagnation. In other words, we just sit around, we just do it that way because we've always done it that way. It is mind-boggling to me how many people who are in positions of leadership in the church actually say things like, well, we have always done it that way. Or, you know, I have 20 years of t-shirts that look at, from that same event. 
That, that, that may not be inherently bad, but the problem is this. Have you asked the greater question, should we be doing it at all? Is that what God wants to do? Are we just doing it because we've always done it? If your answer is we've always done it, you have the wrong answer. You have the wrong answer. That is not ever the right answer. If God tells you you should do it again, then do it again. But if it's just because we have always done it that way, you might want to look to see if you're supposed to do it at all. And a third thing. Every successive leader is different. And each leader has to maintain their individual identity, otherwise they will become hypocrites. I can't be Pastor Steve Mays. Pastor Steve Mays was not Pastor Chuck Smith. Pastor Chuck Smith was not like Billy Graham, and on and on and on and on and on. It doesn't matter whose name you put in that list. It would not matter. The fact of the matter is, every single leader has their own sets of gifts, their own talents, their own abilities, things they can do, things they know. You know, people often say, well, yeah, I just can't. I can't believe how much science you bring into it. Well, that's because I happen to like science. But not every pastor does. And not every pastor should. That just happens to be how God's wired me. So if you hold someone else to that same criteria, and they might be a wonderful expositor of the word, but you're just going, well, where's the science, man? <laughs> you might miss what God wants to say to you. And so we have to be careful People are individuals, and they must, both societally and in a sense in leadership, be treated as individuals. I think, again, I think this is a great problem in our society right now. We don't see people as individuals. When you stop and talk to someone, just greet them as the individual person with dignity and humanity that they're supposed to have given by God, and you have something to strike up a conversation. If you try and lump them all into a group, say, well, you must be like one of those people, that's where we have problems. Great leaders keep their individuality. You see, when you look at this passage, what you're going to find that was really critical is that Moses was a servant. He's called such throughout the Bible. Joshua is going to be called a servant. He's called so throughout the book of Joshua. Jesus actually said, if you want to be great, you need to be the servant of all. Amen? So the issue is, are you willing to serve? Any pastor that needs to be served should not be a pastor. A pastor is supposed to be like Jesus. That means a servant. It's actually the definition of a shepherd, someone who serves. And so in that sense, what we're going to see is Pastor Joshua, the servant. Verse 3, three special promises to go with those three principles. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. So here's the continuity. There was a plan. That plan actually started with whom? Abraham. There was a promise made to Abraham. Are you going to be the goat in that moment? Because from God's perspective, in that moment... The greatest of all time is actually you. Don't miss that. Sunday school teachers are often goats. They're often the greatest of all time. They very rarely get to see the long-term fruit of the ministry. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. People who do the things that you don't even see behind the scenes in this church, to me, they're the goat. They're, They're the greatest. Because they, they enable somebody like me to use my gifts to actually be able to stand here and do what I'm doing right now. I'm not worried about what's going on at the sound board back there. If you ever look at that thing, most of you will look at it and go, say, what? It's 
It's like two and a half thousand knobs on that thing. You go back there and you start punching buttons, we'd all be, you know, we'd have to no longer have a sound system. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Come some familiar words. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Remember who else said that? Jesus himself. That's God. That's who he is. It's who he's always been. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. God is 100% capable, able, and will keep his promises. He has more than enough resources. He's not short on anything. And so since Joshua had given a threefold task to perform, remember, they're to cross the river, they're to claim the land, they're to defeat the enemy. That's the three things. God gives them three promises to go along with those three things that they have to do. First, God promises that they would successfully enter the land no matter what battles they faced. Church, you need to hear that tonight. In Christ, you will cross over into the promised land no matter what battles you face on this earth. You will. That's not a you might That's not, well, I kind of sort of think so. He that lives and believes in me, though he or she, it's not a gender thing, shall die, you will live. Why? Because you're going to heaven. The battle belongs to the Lord. It was fought at the cross. Jesus already won. Amen? Sometimes people almost treat their, their, their positional righteousness in Christ as if it's kind of, well, I sort of think so, maybe. Now, you need to be bold like Joshua is going to be bold. Over the centuries, God had reaffirmed that promise. All the way from Genesis chapter 12, when he gave that promise to Abraham, It was actually his last words to Moses in Deuteronomy 34. And God repeats it again as they're entering into the land. God is basically saying, I want you to go take what is yours. I gave it to you. Now, this is not transferable to you and, say, a BMW. Okay? That's not what's going on here. This is, thus said the Lord. The Lord was very specific about what that was that implies the will of God was expressed. And so when the will of God is expressed and you know what it is and God has told you to do it, you can go get it. It's yours. So important as a leader. God's promised us these things. It's like, Lord, you said it. it I'm going to go do it. They had tremendous, if you look at Numbers 13, which is the story when they got to the edge of the promised land, you look at what happened when they got to Kadesh Barnea, and they're looking in, and the 12 spies go, and 10 come back, and they're like, man, we ain't going in there. There is no way in the world we're going into that land. It's not happening. What did Joshua and Caleb come back with? They're lugging humongous clusters of grapes. They don't see the giants. They're not worried about being squished like grasshoppers. They're not seeing the sons of Anak. Joshua and Caleb are going, God gave it to us. Look what he stuck in the land. It's ours. Let's go get it. When God promises, we need to go get it. We need to take ground, not give ground. Too many Christians give ground to the enemy. Just like, well, you know, I don't know. God wants your kids to be saved. Go after them. God wants your family to know Jesus. Go after them. God wants your coworkers to know Jesus. Go after them. I can tell you some things that God's already given you. And that's victory over the lies of the enemy if you'll go after it. Amen? 
again, these are, these are things for our living as leaders in our little spheres. Wherever you are, not just as a pastor or a leader in the church, but as a leader in your own life. It is impossible in the Christian life to just simply stand still. If you're standing still, you are what we call a target. You're a target. If you don't want to get shot, don't sit still. Keep moving. Tell the devil you're not going down that easy. You're going to have to come after me because I'm coming after you. Push forward. Take ground. Don't surrender. There was a boldness. That's a challenge to us. It's the challenge of the church. We covered that in Hebrews 6, actually. We have to keep moving. We have to press on. We have to push ahead. A second special promise. God had promised Joshua victory over any, any, and all adversaries. Every last one, no matter how powerful they seem to be. Do you understand that? That's who you are in Christ. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and the Holy Spirit is the thing that empowered the creation and you have been rescued from death and given new life in Christ, with God, exactly as Mary understood, all things are possible. There is nothing impossible for God. And God has given you a life to live. Then in that sense, don't take this wrong, but in that sense, you are invincible. Because what's the worst thing that can happen? You die. What happens when you die? You get a whole bunch more powerful, and you're going to come back with Jesus. Amen? Amen? <laughs> you have to recognize who you are. If you don't recognize who you are, then you start walking around and say, well, you know, I don't know. You are a valiant warrior in the army of God. That's why God could tell them, go take the land. Because in righteousness, if they died in faith, they win. They took the land, they win. It's what we call a win-win situation, amen? Amen. That's, that's why sometimes I, I look at how we think and it's like, man, are we fighting for the victory or are we fighting from victory? We should be fighting from victory, not for. The battle belongs to the Lord. It's already been won. So when you look at your life that way, you think differently. It doesn't mean that things in your life aren't going to bother you. It doesn't mean you won't have some circumstantial problems and you know, people that are going to mistreat you. You're going to have human emotion mixed in with that. But in the end, you are who God declares you are. And you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you. Amen? Don't forget these things. Because a lot of times the church just walks around powerless because we're not walking in who we actually are. We've actually surrendered. We've given back to the enemy control of these areas of our lives. And so we're wondering, I don't know. I would say to you, maybe you don't know who you are in Christ, if that's you. Look, we all have bad days. And so I don't want anybody to get all, you know, don't get whacked out in your head. You know, it's like, well, you know, I guess I'm just done. No, it's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm just trying to say, when you see those times coming where you start to doubt who you are in Christ, you've got to remember the promises of God. You are who he says you are, Period. Amen? It's what Joshua believed. As it was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, says the Lord. I don't know about you, but I, if God's going, I can go. Amen? If I got to go in the power of Jeff, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting a hammock. I'm like, no, I'll watch somebody else go. But if God's going, I'll go. 
God's going, so let's go. God promises his people. That's why Jesus ends Matthew's gospel with this very same promise. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. He's just told them in the Olivet Discourse, man, things are going to get rough in the last days, but don't you worry about it. I got it. I'm with you. Joshua got the same promise. Are you going to walk in that promise? I pray you are. You see, before Joshua begins this conquest of Jericho, which we don't get to until chapter 5, really, God says, I'm going to be with you. My presence is with you. Wherever you go, I go. We'll go together. Man, you need to cling to that promise that God is with you. I've had so many times in my life where it's like, Lord, I feel alone. I feel like nobody cares. Nobody knows. Nobody wants to help. You know, when the going is good, people like what's going on. But when the going is hard, it's amazing how many people are like, well, you know, maybe not so much. There are lonely times on this earth. But God is with us. Every moment of every day, the promise of his presence is what sustains you when things are hard. That's what sustains you when things are hard. It's not that everything goes the right way. It's not that every day you wake up and, oh, wow, there's unicorns and rainbows. You know, there's not a lot of unicorn and rainbow days, actually. There's a lot more days that have a little bit of a gray cloud hanging over them for most of us. But God is with you in the gray days. God's with you on the rainy days. He's with you on the days when you think nobody cares. When, when nobody wants to go with you, God will go with you. And if he's going, you're okay. It's going to be fine. Why? Because God keeps his promises. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. And whether that's the end of the literal age, which we're living in right now, or whether it's the end of your life, God is with his kids. Always. Always. All day, every day. And a third promise, that Joshua would actually get to divide the land as an inheritance. Remember, that was promised. Each tribe was supposed to get a portion or an inheritance in the land. We're going to see that Joshua actually gets to fulfill that promise in this book. And the reason that that's so important to me personally is it reminds me that God keeps his word. What he says he will do. And the reason to me personally that that matters so much is there are a lot of things that we do that it's just like, well, Lord... I don't know how that's going to work out. There are steps of faith. And those steps of faith, don't, the, the whole road map's not before you. Every stop in the journey is not marked out. It isn't like in the olden days when we used to actually carry maps in the door panels of our cars. Some of you, again, I know some of us are we're going, we, we missed those days. And then, we, then, then you have to think, yeah, but I was constantly driving with my knees and I had the map up there. I'm not sure I was actually watching the road. Right? You know what I'm saying? You're like, it's like, hey, honey, look at this. You get out your pen. Stop over here at the world's largest ball of twine. Or my favorite, Chief Yellow Horse. Then you get there and you're like, What? A lot of stops in the journey are like that. They're just like, they seem like it'd be okay, but you get there and it's like, well, that's a disappointment. Anybody figured out that life is filled with disappointments? Or am I the only one? Life is filled with disappointments. Things don't always go the way you want them to go. Even our vacations don't always turn out the way we planned, amen? Amen. Anybody ever had one of those trips where you go and you end up staying for, you know, a day in the airport? Well, this is lovely. 
I'm eating my second $28 thing of fries. It happens to be the only thing that's open in the entire airport when you're there. Yeah, and you're thinking, oh, it's going to be great. Life's like that. The big vacation's coming. That, that once and for all one, amen, when you get to heaven. God's going to keep his promises. It's all going to work out in the end. Amen. That's why we look forward to heaven. If it was all good while we're here, if everything went exactly the way we wanted to go, I'm not sure how many people would be longing for heaven. But because it doesn't go the way we want it to all the time, it makes me long all the more for heaven. I'm like, man, get me out of this place. I have that very Pauline view. Lord, I, you know, it's better for a lot of the people around me that I stay, but, you know, if it's okay with you, could I go? I'm still here. So it must be God's will to be here. Amen? And finally, as we see God keeps his word throughout this, it's like God's promises. You know, sometimes we look at God's promises almost like we can just kind of, you know, we can kind of lay on them. Well, that's true some of the time, but I look at God's promises more like the prod to get us to work. It's like, I've got things to do. God's promised that it's going to work out in the end. He's going to be with me, low always to the end of the age. And he's kind of poking me along to get busy. It's like, Jeff, you don't need to sit and rest here. There'll be time for that in heaven because my kingdom is a kingdom of rest. So why don't you get busy? Let's go have some fun. Let's chase some giants. Let's go take some cities. Let's knock down some walls. Let's go do a little dance around the devil's place. And again, I'm not suggesting that you should tempt the devil. I'm not saying that you should, know. let's go see if we can find the most demonic person and try and you know, save them. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is God may call you into those extraordinary places where it's like, man, Lord, if you're going, I'm going to go with you. It's like, it looks like a walled city to me, but if you say we can take it, I'm in. And that's why this ends with this incredible, one of the greatest words of encouragement in the Old Testament. Verse 7. Only be strong. The original language here is stunning. It basically says, don't ever be anything but incredibly strong. Only be strong. It's a command. It's not like a possibility. It's not one of many selections. It's like because of who you are in me, Joshua, you only be strong. That's who you are. Go be that. And very courageous. The word very means extraordinarily so. Be extraordinarily courageous and only be strong in other words don't ever be weak don't ever be timid don't ever pull back be extraordinarily courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left in other words, stay on track. God's got a perfect plan. He knows exactly what he wants you to do. And you can be absolutely sure that you have sufficient strength in him. You can be bold and courageous. That you may prosper. Notice the result. This is nuts. This is like a crazy promise. This is totally crazy. Think about it. I want you to only be strong and extraordinarily courageous that you might do all according to the law of Moses, my servant. What he commanded you to do, don't go to the rider. You just go straight at it. Go straight at it. Right? I don't care who's guarding the rim. Go down the middle of the key and dunk on top of them. You can tell it's basketball season. Pastor Jeff is excited. 
It's like raise up and posterize that dude. I don't care who's down there. I don't care if he's 710. There isn't one now. Don't go to the right or the left. You go at the rim that you might score. You might prosper. That you might put up numbers wherever you go. That you'd be successful. That you'd fill it up. The book would be full. It's like on that day, posterize the devil. Rose up, he tried to block it, but God was with me. And I threw it down. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. It's like the playbook. So here's the playbook. You go memorize that puppy. Because we got one for every single eventuality. I don't know how many of you have ever seen an NBA playbook, but they're thick. They're all digitized now, and they're on tablets. Looks like there's a play for everything. Right hand out of bounds, left hand out of bounds, sideline out of bounds, look close to the baseline. It's nuts. There's like three pages for one, for one pass that's going to take one and a half seconds to run the whole play. And the reason I'm saying this, God has a plan for your life, and it's that precise. It's like he knows where the enemy's at. He knows where the defenders are. He knows where the rest of your team is. And he knows exactly what he wants you to do. If you're not a basketball fan, I'll change sports later. <laughs> Sorry. I think most of us know what I'm saying now. Like you watch some of the stuff that happens. It's like, man, how did that pass get there? Well, it's because somebody was paying attention to the playbook. And somebody waited for the exact moment. The coach called it. He said, I want you to wait the count of a half. Not one, not two. Count one. Th and inbound the ball. And somebody's going to be right there. right where you, They're not going to be there when you throw the ball, but they'll be there when the ball gets there. That type of precision is available in your life in Christ. Don't depart from it. Observe and do according to what's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. That is a plan for success. And I pray you have it implemented in your life. I, I pray that as this really applies, of course, to God's word for us as believers... Now moving from the metaphor to real life, that when we know that the Lord is with us and we know what the Lord wants of us and we know the enemy's tactics and we know what he wants to do to us and we know who we have on our team and we know and we know and we know, you have a lot more opportunity to be successful. Amen? But when you don't know the playbook, when you don't know who's on your team, when you don't believe in yourself, and this is one of those times when there is a sense that you need to remember God made you who you are so you can believe in who you are in him. That's not you self-inflating your ego. That's you remembering who you are in Christ. Amen? When you do that, you are more than a conqueror. So why the Apostle Paul, when he's writing the church at Rome, when he writes there in Romans 8, beginning in verse 31, and really through the end of the chapter, what can we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? Remember what he says? He goes on, look, I'm persuaded that not even death can stop me. Famine, peril, sword. He throws all these things in me, in, in there. Now, when I know the height and depth of the love that God has, there's not any created thing that can stand in your way. Why? Because the promise to Joshua is still true. 
If God be for you, who can be against you? Let's walk in that victory this week, amen? It's already been won, paid for at the cross. The question is, are you gonna read the playbook and know who you are? Know you're part of the team. And let God use you for his glory. Have I not commanded you, God says? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's a promise, church. Amen. Would you stand and we'll close in prayer. Gabriel's words to Mary are just as true as when Gabriel spoke them. For with God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Don't forget that. Father, we thank you that through you, Jesus, we are more than conquerors. We are hyper-conquerors through him. That's you, Jesus, who loves us. And by you and through you, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The converse is true. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, we choose to dwell on the other side of that equation. We believe you, Lord, and we want to walk in victory. So we want to always be strong, and we want to always be very courageous because we know you and we know the battle's been won. So help us to walk in that victory, take our place on the line. Lord, do what you've called us to do. We know you are good, and we know that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen.